So we are live now. Namaskar and a warm welcome to all the distinguished speakers, delegates tuning in through the Maritime India Summit web platform plenary session five of the Maritime India Summit 2021. The topic of this session is port-led industrialization building port cities and maritime clusters. We have a galaxy of speakers who have joined with us today, this afternoon, from across the globe, starting from South Korea in the east to Brazil in the west. Joining us from South Korea, we have Mr. Ki Chan Nam, President and Chief Executive Officer, Busan Port Authority, we have Kamol Sak from Prayun, Director General from Port Authority of Thailand. We have Mr. Bhushan Kumar, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Ports, Shipping and Waterways, Government of India. We have a distinguished speaker from world's largest producer of steel, Arcelor Mittal, Mr. Sanjay Sharma, Chief Executive Officer. We have Mr. Judge Jen Nyu Wen Managing Director, Port of Amsterdam International. Joining us also is Mr. Vincent from Belgium, Port of Zeebrugge. We have also one dignitary from the west of the GMT, Mr. Jose Firma, Chief Executive Officer, Port of Aku, Brazil. I welcome all the speakers. We also have co-conveners. I am Ravindran, Chairman, Chennai Port Trust. We have other conveners here, Mr. Rama Mohan Rao, Chairman, Vishakhapatnam Port Trust. Mr. Sanjay Sethi, Chairman, Jawaharlal Nehru Port Trust. Mr. Sanjay Mehta, Chairman, Dindayal Port Trust and Mr. Vineet Kumar, Chairman, Paradi Port Trust. Without taking much time, let us get into the agenda. To begin with the proceedings, it gives me great pleasure to invite my co-convener, Mr. Ram Mohan Rao, Chairman, Chairman Port Trust, Port Trust, to kindly provide a introduction of the topic and set the context for remainder of the session. It's over to you, Mr. Ram Mohan Rao. Sir, you are on mute. Yeah. Honorable Minister for Ports, Shipping and Waterways, eminent speakers of the session, could you please play the video? Honorable Minister for Ports, Shipping and Waterways, eminent speakers of the session, distinguished delegates, experts from the industry, policy makers, representatives from ports across India and abroad, officials from different ministries and departments of government of India, state maritime boards, FIKI, media, ladies and gentlemen. A very good afternoon to all of you. I cordially invite you to this important session on port-led industrialization, building of port cities and maritime clusters. Focal points for the session are expected to be related to leveraging port ecosystems for industrialization and generating new employment opportunities, investment scenarios and opportunities for the industry, opportunities in major ports in India, Maritime clusters, developer operator perspective, experience, concerns, and future strategies. Port cities learning from global best practices. Indian maritime sector has been playing a key role in the economic development since ages. 
the oldest known port in India, Lothal, located in Gujarat, existed about 4,500 years ago. India's contribution in the world's mercantile trade during 18th century was 25%. Traditionally, ports and waterways were considered as terminals for transportation of goods and people. The need for other modes of transportation such as roads, airways, railways emerged with the growth of population over the years, but it resulted in environmental concerns. Therefore, transportation by sea and inland waterways still continues to play an important role in economic development of the world. The advantage of water transport or in terms of cost saving, reduction in rail, road traffic congestion, and decline in air pollution. With the advent of globalization, there is a paradigm shift in the port ecosystems across the ports in the world. Ports are operating beyond their boundaries, extending their logistic supply chain, providing E2E logistics, adopting state-of-the-art technology, digital business process, enabling ease of doing business, enhancing regional connectivity, etc. Ports like Busan, Shanghai, Singapore, Hamburg, Tokyo, Durban have all contributed enormously for the development of trade and industries. In India also, major industrial regions have come up in port regions, especially in the states of West Bengal, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala. We can learn from ports like Rotterdam, Singapore, Fujian, Houston, and Dubai that owe their success largely to vibrant economic clusters in vicinity. Deen Dayal Port, Kandra, on western coast is the major main gateway to northern part of India and handles nearly 125 million tons of cargo. It caters to petroleum, steel, and fertilizer industry. It handles 70% of India's timber trade and poised to become furniture hub of India. Jawaharlal Nehru Port, Navi Mumbai, is the premier container port in India, handling around 7 million TEUs. The port is connected to about 200 ports in the world. It is developing satellite ports at Vadavan and dry ports at Jalna and Vartha, Sangli, and Nashik. The port operates on hub and spoke model for cargo movement and is connected to northern India through dedicated freight corridor. Paradip port located in the state of Varissa, which is close to mineral rich interland, around, handles around 114 million tons and caters to major industries in petroleum, power, steel and aluminium sectors. Chennai port in the state of Tamil Nadu on the east coast of India handles around 1.5 million TUs. The port also caters to petroleum industry and is a hub port for automobiles and white goods in southern India. Shyama Prasad Mukherjee port, Kolkata in the state of West Bengal is the oldest port consisting of the Kolkata dock system and Haldia dock container complex and caters to jute, tea, steel, and heavy engineering, mining, mineral, cement, pharmaceutical, food processing, agriculture, electronics, and textile industries. Vishakapatnam port in the state of Andhra Pradesh is specialized in handling all types of cargo and caters to industries in petroleum, steel, power, fertilizer, aluminium besides container handling. It has longest rail network among ports, second gateway port to Nepal, largest marine products exporter, first Indian seaport to run on entirely solar power. The palletization plant in Vishakapatnam is the best example of port-led industrialization. Economies in the world have been forming maritime clusters or commodity clusters which specialize on a particular sector where they have comparative advantage in terms of skill sets, expertise, synergies, availability of raw materials, 
and other logistics. This facilities facilitates higher productivity and innovation. Regional connectivity is another area that can be nurtured for port-led industrialization. India signed 11 trade agreements with different regions like Pemstech, ASEAN, and the Pacific Regional Corporation. The Chabahar port in Iran, developed by India, is part of the transit and transport corridor will connect India with Central Asia. India is currently fifth largest economy in the world and envisions to become five trillion economy in the next five to six years. It is forecasted India will be the fastest growing economy by 2022. Ports have an important role to play in achieving vision of India. India is bestowed with the required advantage for pursuing port-led industrialization. The long coastline of 7,500 kilometers and 12 major ports and more than 200 non-major ports. National Highway Network, the golden quadrilateral connecting most of the major industrial, agriculture and cultural centers of India. Development of high speed and high capacity railway corridors called dedicated freight corridors, Delhi and Mumbai, Delhi and Calcutta, exclusively meant for transportation of goods and commodities. Special economic zones, multimodal logistic hubs, parks, inland container depots, container freight stations, dry ports, cold chains, and highest population of young people in the world for the next decade. The government of India is adopting dynamic policies to propel significant investments in the sector. Act India policy, Atma Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan, Make in India. Make in India is a major national program to strengthen India's manufacturing sector by attracting investments from across the globe, utilizing existing human capital and creating employment opportunities. National Industrial Corridor Development Program aims to develop new industrial cities as smart cities. The Sagarmala Program envisions number of projects and enablers which can unlock the opportunities for port-led development. Port modernization, port connectivity, port-led industrialization, and coastal community development. Ministry of Ports, Shipping, and Waterways has prepared a vision document called Maritime India Vision 2030. Key themes identified for India to secure its place at the forefront of the global maritime sector. The vision envisages investments opportunities to the tune of rupees 1000 billion and new employment opportunities up to 1 million in port sector by 2030. The major port authority bill 2020 is a major milestone towards this direction. Going forward, coastal economic zones, industrial clusters and commodity specific industries are to be identified for each major port to act as the main vehicle for port-led industrialization. Ports have to focus on developing plug-and-play infrastructure and value-added services to drive port-led industrialization. Before I conclude, I am hopeful that the session brings out new ideas and takeaways which will be extremely fruitful Thank you and Namaskar. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramon. Thank you. Ramon. Thank you. In the presentation and setting the context for this interesting session. You have brought out the importance of the ports vis-a-vis -vis the industry while touching upon the major ports in India and opportunities available therein. As we understand that there are opportunities available to be explored, the important aspect is to gainfully utilize these opportunities to add value to the society at large while providing employment opportunities to the populace. We have with us Mr. Kamolsak Promprayon, who is a visionary leader who has set a bright vision for the Port Authority of Thailand and taken a successful inside-out approach which had people at its heart. 
He led from the forefront to bring agility and receptiveness to the port operations. Under his leadership, the Port Authority of Thailand rewrote its organizational strategy to develop world-class ports. Now I request him to share his viewpoints on opportunities in major ports, port ecosystem vis-a-vis -vis the industries. Over to you, sir. Chairman of Chennai Podcast, Chairman of Utah Pasanam Podcast, all executives from government and private sector, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and privilege to participate and deliver a speech on behalf of the Port Authority of Thailand. At this virtual maritime media summit 2021, which is conducting online in light of the COVID 19 pandemic. Despite the challenge we face as a global community, I am afraid that we all here can continue our efforts to strengthen the relationship between Thailand and India where we have all. So far, as we know, Thailand has placed strong importance on its long-standing relationship with India, and the two countries have reached on the, an accord under the vision of Act East this has focused on strengthening Thai between India and the Asian country in all dimension, especially with an emphasis on the port development. The two countries have reached a concrete cooperation by joining signing MOU between the North Force, which is under the supervision of the Port Authority of Thailand. And the five high potential port of India comprising Chennai Port Pass, Kolkata Port Pass, Isakha Patanam Port Pass, Isana Patanam Port and the World Hall of Chennai Continental Terminal. The Port Authority of Thailand, or PAT, has a task particularly important to excellent of port management and services by implementing advanced technology and innovation in our operation to evaluate its performance at a uh, global standard and to be a world class port with modern infrastructure and facility. We are protesting constantly to become a half of intermodal passport, connecting the domestic passport network to the global logistic system seamlessly. To achieve our plan, the PAT has carried out various key development projects corresponding to the national step team and government policy, which I would like to mention some of them with the recent update here. First, for the main project of the PAT responding to the economic expect 
both in my hand as God before. And digital technology advancement. Let me first start with the last one for development phase three. America development screen. That is a key priority project of the government Eastern Economic Corridor or EEC. Currently, all the existing terminal in Lanchaban for phase one and phase two are able to communicate total container volume of 11 million TUs per year. Take in, into consideration the four class growth rate in the container volume and the competition of the construction of a team. The total container handling capacity will be boost to approximately 18 million TU per year. With this growth, Namchewan Port will become a main port for international cargo shipping that complement the government Eastern Economic Corridor scheme. Speaking of the government Eastern Economic Corridor Develop Project, is considered as the key mechanism driving the country economy and enhancing the country competitiveness for the sustainable growth of the Thai economy. The establishment of the EEC will accept more important and export activity to area where Ranchaban Port Factory is serving as a region transportation hub to cope with the trade expansion and become global trade gateway with smart emerging technology adopt in management and operation. Additional three, the Thai government also see an opportunity to bring in the Gulf of Thailand and Adaman Sea. With a land bridge solution by cast the state of Malacca, which will dramatically shorten travel time and logistics support. The alternative would be ring the railway and highway promoting multimodal passport. At this moment, this project currently in the process of feasibility study by the Office of Passport and Traffic Policy and Planning. Second, aside from development of the Lamshadam or Trade Tree, project on infrastructure and services capacity enhancement of the number is also being initiated. The PIT is committed to develop the non as the trade gateway of the Western Thailand Connecting Cargo Transport Network between Eastern Economic Corridor and the Binstech country and supporting the expansion of trade and investment under the Southern Economic Corridor project. This, is, this will also significantly help reduce logistic costs and shipping time between Thailand and the South Asia sub-region, Middle East and Europe as well in this region. In the fulfilling the plan to make Lanong Port as a recent gateway to Minsk State, 
and the authoritarian passport infrastructure of all more. is in need of development and integration, not only border and road, but also railway and the construction of Chung Hon Banong Railway will be launched soon. This will help Banong moving towards the main gateway of Andaman Sea and the Cup of Thailand. The project is under the process of conducting feasibility study on the improvement of infrastructure and logistic connectivity. After that, a proposed new terminal on the Gulf of Thailand will be located and constructed to offer an alternative shipping loop that lower the logistic cost and shipping time for important and export activity, and also help increase business operator over on competitiveness. Third, at the same time, the PAT has launched the automated container terminal development project at the Bangkok port West Key based on the smart port concept where semi-automated operation system with the high efficiency is adopted to increase container yard management efficiency. Fourth, in the addition, the single rail transfer operation project or SRTO has been introduced at the Ram Shivan Court to support the government policy on model chip transferring of container by railway. This can, this can shorten the logistic cost. If significantly, we are also focused on maximizing access utilization to generate add volume to business and gain appropriate rate of the return ensuring the organization growth by implementing assessment projects. See, last but not least, the PIT has taken a bold step to fully develop our organization forward before. We have implemented and imitated data logistic chain by youth hot community system. This adopt S1 digital technology to manage the big data and serve as the data center of standard operation in order to enhance the efficiency of core services with modern management standards. Over the past 20 years, the PAT has already laid down its development policy that's in line with the national strategy in boosting trade competitiveness of the country. One of our priorities is to develop more port infrastructure and facility which we believe are essential for drive the national economy in the fast changing digital world. However, we have smooth pass in the in this journey. It requires collaboration and integration among stakeholders from different sectors to work together, enhancing volume added, change in economy, trading and investment. Ladies and gentlemen, I truly believe that this conference will be provide a dynamic platform for knowledge and opportunity exchange.
which lead to collaboration, capacity building of the maritime force of the region. In closing, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the organizing committee for the dedicated dedication is making this conference a great success. Under this challenging circumstance, and I hope the further maritime and economic tie between Thailand and India in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Thank you. for uh, giving a detailed account of the developments taking place in Thailand especially touching upon the western side new ports coming up regional ports thank you very much our next speaker is mr bhushan kumar joint secretary ministry of ports shipping and waterways he has 23 years of experience has worn multiple hats in various domains of the shipping sector ranging from leading a shipping company to heading the legal aspects of maritime sector. He has played a key role in several projects at various ports in India. And he is going to shed some light on the opportunities in India for port-led industrialization and how it is expected to be in the next 10 years. Over to you, Mr. Bhushan Kumar. Good afternoon to the conveners, the speakers, and the delegates attending this uh, session. It's a great honor to speak in this session. Uh, may I request Fikki team to share the presentation? So, as you all are aware, that Honorable Prime Minister has launched the Maritime India Vision 2030, which clearly identifies all the uh, priorities of the government. I hope that you must have gone through that document that is available on our website. In case you have not uh, uh, referred to that, I would request all of you to go through that document. It clearly stipulates all the opportunities available in the maritime sector for all stakeholders, ports, shipping, waterways, everything we have covered in that document very well with timelines, with implementing agencies. Also, we have put on our website a, a list of 400 projects uh, having value of $31 billion with clear timelines. That is also available on our website. I would request you to uh, go through that document as well. Uh, due to limitation of time, I'll quickly run through this presentation and touch upon various important uh, aspects of uh, uh, the opportunities. So, uh, most of you may be aware of this, but for the uh, uh, new uh, investors in this forum, I'll just briefly go through this slide. We have 240 ports in India. Uh, uh, which includes 12 major ports. In India, when we say major ports, is the ports which are controlled by central government, those are called major ports. Others are uh, controlled by the respective state governments. Out of 240 ports, uh, 100 ports are functional and around 60 ports are handling the exim uh, traffic. In India's total exim trade, we through seaports, we handle 95% of the volume and our larger uh, chunk is uh, of fuel, coal, iron ore and containers. And we expect that uh, the uh, commodities will largely remain same with containers traffic uh, increasing in uh, next 10 years and uh, there will be reduction in the coal. Uh, uh, imports as we are also ramping up our uh, domestic coal production. Uh, the government run ports handle around 55% of the total uh, and uh, uh, the state run non major ports handle around 45% of the uh, traffic, uh, uh, the cargo traffic in our ports. Next slide, please. 
So if we say the uh, see the uh, cargo traffic handled in our uh, ports, we have we are growing at a decent pace of around uh, six percent CAGR. And when we compare with the world averages as well as uh, averages of the developing economies, we are far ahead in terms of uh, cargo volume growth in our ports. And that is the reason that in last uh, uh, 26 years, we have grown nine fold in terms of the capacity. And in, uh, apart from the exim trade, we are seeing uh, uh, more than 10% growth in the coastal traffic as well. So that is how we are now expecting that our cargo uh, volumes will double in next 10 years. From 1.3 billion, we will be handling close to 2.5 billion metric ton by 2030. Apart from uh, cargo, we, are, we have also seen uh, tremendous growth in the cruise passengers, cruise related uh, uh, traffic. Uh, of course, due to COVID, now it is not there, but eventually now uh, COVID after vaccinations and all, uh, we expect that uh, the cruise business will come back to its normal uh, uh, pace. So, so this is the reason that we need a lot of investment in infrastructure. We need to create more and more uh, berths, more and more ports. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, third slide, you are on the second last slide now. Ticketing. I think there is, uh, go back. So, so there are tremendous opportunities in the uh, uh, power sector. Go back, go back. Still, that slide is not there. Go back. Still. Back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Yeah. So in maritime uh, India vision, we have uh, touched upon the ports where we are saying that we need to develop uh, mega ports, increase the draft of the existing ports, set up new ports. Also in the existing ports, we have identified 39 bus to be offered on PPP mode. We are going to set up uh, in, uh, port led industries on plug and play model. We are going to set up warehousing, uh, cold storages, and also we are going to offer the dredging on PPP mode uh, and also tug and toy services on PPP mode. We will also make our ports as green ports and introduce new fuels like LNG, CNG in our ports. That also we are developing a policy to offer these projects as well on PPP mode. On waterway side, we are developing new waterways, Roro Ropex jetties, logistic parks. And uh, on the shipping side, we are developing new cruise terminals. We are investing in uh, ship repair, recycling facilities. Overall, we need, we are looking for an investment close to 3 lakh crores out of which 1.25 lakh crore we need purely in the infrastructure. And once we will invest in the infrastructure, the opportunity in the transportation, utilities, operation maintenance, IT, tourism, education, there will be a lot of opportunity in all the sectors as the, uh, uh, the ecosystem will kickstart. So uh, next slide, please. And uh, all the projects which we have identified, we will try to offer first on the PPP mode. And uh, that will be our uh, uh, first attempt. The government will invest on the basic facilities, basic infrastructure like road connectivity, rail connectivity, and other uh, 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 basic infrastructure requirement which a PPP concessionaire will look for. Uh, so, just to give you a background of uh, our PPP projects so far, we this sector was opened uh, to private players. The maritime sector was opened to private players in 1997, uh, with first uh, terminal operating in JNPT in 1999, and from then onwards till now, we have 54 projects 
successfully running with the investment of 4.2 billion dollars in our various major ports and also 24 projects are under implementation having another investment of 2.3 billion usd so in total we have 6.5 billion usd already invested in major ports and there is huge investment in non major ports as well so we have taken several uh, steps to further promote the uh, ppp based investments we have recently uh, enacted a new act major port authority act 2021 where we are giving more freedom to the ppp concessionaire for fixing the uh, tariffs and all and also we are in process of revising the model concession agreement where we will give more flexibility to the PPP concessionaire and also reduce uh, the risk uh, on the part of the uh, private investor. So we expect that uh, after these changes, a lot of investments, a lot of investors will come forward and invest in our uh, port sector. Next slide, please. Uh, so in, in ports, yeah, so we, we uh, 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 are looking for a lot of projects. Similarly, for in national waterways, we are trying to operationalize seven more waterways. 16 are already operational. And uh, so in this waterways also, we will offer several uh, terminals uh, for development as well as for operation and maintenance on PPP mode. And also the dredging opportunities also we will try to offer on the PPP mode in all the waterways. Then with this, with the development of more waterways, there will of course be opportunities on the vessels, on the logistics side, as well for uh, the private investors. Next slide, please. We are also, uh, uh, we have also identified uh, more than 40 potential locations for starting the Roro Ropex services and the locations are marked on the map. We, uh, a couple of months back, we started uh, Hazira to Goga service and within three months it is running almost full and now the operator is bringing a new vessel, adding new vessel there. So, so with that success story, we want to ramp up that and we want to add 40 more uh, uh, locations for Roro Ropex. Currently, we are handling around 140 million passengers through uh, ferries and Roro Ropex uh, in our country. We want to increase this to 700 million in next 10 years. And that is how we are looking for investment in Roro Ropex terminals, as well as operation and maintenance, ferries, uh, vessels, and also logistics side. So a lot of opportunities are there in this sector as well. Next slide, please. We have also taken up this new sector uh, for development for uh, uh, river cruises, as well as sea planes. Recently, we floated expression of interest and the response was tremendous from the investor side. So we have now uh, identified 16 potential locations for development of river cruises as well as sea plane services. So this is also a new sector where we will set up the infrastructure. We will try to set up on PPP mode if it is not uh, the interest on the, because this is, we are beginning with this. So uh, we will invest from our side and then we will look for uh, investment in the sea, the seaplane operation side from the investors. Next slide. As I said, the cruise terminals we have seen, we have seen uh, before COVID a uh, lot of growth in the cruise uh, uh, traffic, cruise passengers growth. It increased seven times in last five years. So seeing that now we are developing more cruise terminals at various locations. Recently, we, uh, the, the uh, new terminal was launched in Cochin, and now we are in process of uh, setting up new cruise terminal in Goa. Mumbai cruise terminal is already under construction. We have identified new sites, Somnath, Konar, Kolkata, Porbandar, and many more uh, for development of cruise terminals and we will offer these also on ppp mode if they, there is some viability issue we 
can create basic infrastructure at our own and then offer on OM. So these all opportunities are also listed in the uh, compendium of uh, projects, which is available on our website. Next slide. And we are also taking uh, steps to uh, making to make our ports green ports. So LNG bunkering facilities. We will also convert the vehicles that are playing in our ports onto CNG, electrical, or LNG. And we are in process of formulating a policy to offer these uh, uh, projects also on PPP mode with some kind of uh, viability gap funding if required. So that also will be out in uh, a couple of months. So uh, this is also a new sector which we are trying to uh, uh, develop. Next slide. So uh, now uh, I'll touch upon the opportunities available in our course. Detail list is already available on our website. I'll just give you a flavor of what type of projects are uh, on offer or are going to be offered. So the first one is in Western Dock project in Paradeep Port Trust. The, uh, uh, the qualification process is already going on. Uh, this project will uh, have investment of 400 plus uh, 417 million dollar. This will have capacity of 25 million ton per annum. This is a tri bulk uh, project and uh, environment clearance is already available. Land is uh, within uh, port. So there are no issues. This is ready for investment. The process, the tender is already going on. So the interested investors can probably think of uh, investing in this project. Next. This is a, a Vishakha Patnam Port uh, project, mechanization of uh, their two bus, seven and eight. They are looking for investment of uh, $40 million to add capacity close to 6 million ton per annum. The tenders will be available from May onwards. This is also a uh, bulk terminal. Next slide. This is a VOC port uh, project wherein they are uh, mechanizing uh, North Holberg 3 for dry bulk cargoes. Uh, they will look for investment close to $60 million. They will add uh, around 9 million ton per annum capacity. These uh, tenders will also be floated uh, uh, in a couple of months now. So next slide. Then VOC port is uh, also uh, developing a container terminal and uh, uh, this will uh, uh, call for investment uh, close to 60 million USD. Uh, this, the tenders will be available uh, by April for this project. Next slide. Then mechanization of four berths uh, is being planned in VOC port. The tenders will be available by end of this year. This will call for investment to the tune of $300 million with a capacity of around 19 million ton per annum. So this is another project which you can look for next. Then uh, Syama Prasad Mukherjee port, Kolkata, Kolkata port. So mechanization of their birth seven, eight. Uh, 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 so these tenders will be available next year. Uh, around uh, March and uh, the investment required is around 47 million ton. This is going to be uh, a container uh, terminal. Next. So this is uh, again in Haldia dock complex, a mechanization of their birth number 10. Uh, this will call for investment of around 50 million ton. Uh, and uh, this will also be offered by this year end. Next slide. Mechanization of birth five in Haldia Dock Complex. Uh, the tenders for this project will be offered next year uh, for investment close to 45 million ton, million dollar. Next. Goa Port is, Morma Goa Port is also planning to uh, redevelop their uh, uh, total four births. 
uh, which will call for investment close to 140 million USD. And uh, that will be offered by this year end for investments. Next slide. Then we are also coming up with a uh, new port, transshipment port in Kanyakumari district. That is the extreme south of India. We have already called for expression of interest from the interested investors. Based on the uh, interest received, we will further formulate this project. We intend to offer this project purely on uh, developer model for uh, the PPP investors to develop this project. So we are looking for investment close to $4,000 million in this uh, project. Uh, so uh, the expression of interest is already invited. I'll request the interested uh, uh, investors to participate in that. Next. We are also coming up with uh, a maritime heritage complex in Lothal, uh, which will uh, have uh, maritime museum, themed amusement parks, recreation parks on PPP mode. This will have hotel and themed eco resort. It is going to be some kind of uh, uh, you know museum plus the 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 amusement park like we have Disneyland or uh, the similar thing. So we are trying to make it uh, a world class uh, maritime heritage complex. Uh, so the uh, investment opportunities in these projects will also be opened by this year end. So this is, uh, these are only few projects which I have touched upon in the presentation due to limitation of time. There are 400 similar projects and list is available on our website. So I'll request again all of you to go through that. And we have developed, uh, we have set up a project development cell in the ministry. In case you have any queries, any clarification, any details you uh, want for any projects, we are always there to provide all that details to you. And uh, with that uh, uh, note, uh, I'll uh, end my presentation here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bhushan Kumar, for uh, sharing the vision of the government and highlighting the major opportunities in the Indian maritime sector. On one hand, we have a lot of opportunities. I'm sure there are challenges too, which are to be overcome in order to fully explore the benefits of these opportunities. Who else can better explain these aspects other than our speaker, Mr. Ki Chan Nam, President and CEO, Busan Port Authority, South Korea. He's a learned academician, a leading policy advisor, and, a, and the chief of uh, Busan Port. He has taken up a tough challenge to redevelop the old port in Busan. Recently, he has been instrumental in keeping the supply chain running amidst this COVID-19 pandemic through the required response at Busan port. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, congratulations for hosting the Maritime India Summit 2021. And thanks for inviting me to this uh, summit. Uh, it is my great honor and uh, pleasure to present Busan Port as a global maritime city center. And I would like to share our experience uh, with all of you. The uh, Busan Port Authority (BPA) was inaugurated in 2004 as a state-owned company under the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries, and mainly in charge of Busan Port management and development. In spite of the state-owned company, BPA has independent control on its budget and human resources. And as a supervisory board, there is a port commission supervising the general state of affairs of BPA. Uh, when it comes to the final status of BPA, the total asset is 5.8 billion US dollars with 65% of debt uh, ratio. 
And the credit rating is triple A, evaluated by Moody's uh, Investor Service. As a land road, the main revenues come from terminal concession and port due. Busan port uh, is located at the very center of the Pacific Ocean, connecting east-west trade and north-south trade as well. Uh, with the emergence of mega alliances, most of global carriers have called at Busan port, increasing their connectivity to 269 weekly container services to worldwide. In particular, uh, with it being located between China and Japan, Busan port is equipped uh, with sophisticated feeder network, uh, taking the position of transshipment whole port in the Northeast Asia. Uh, Busan port has been rapidly expanded to respond to the changes of global maritime industry. As of now, we have three ports under operation. North Port, Gamcheon Port, and Busan New Port. In case of North Port, the conventional piers are now under renovation into the waterfront, and the existing container terminals with 17 buses are mainly used by intra Asia carriers. Gamcheon Port mainly handles bulk cargo, including fisheries. Uh, around 25 kilometers away from uh, North Port, uh, there is a new port opened in 2006 and they presented 21 container buses uh, operated by five global terminal operators, including DPW and PSA. Busan uh, Port handled 21.8 billion TEU in 2020 with 9.7 billion TEU of gateway cargo and 12 billion transshipment cargo. Uh, on the screen, uh, you see the conventional pier uh, on the left side in 2006 and on the right side, uh, future plan. Uh, as you see, the conventional piers at the those port has limitations to go with uh, the rapidly evolving uh, environment of the global maritime industry. Furthermore, as the those port is located very nearby the city center, there had been strong demand from uh, the citizens to reshape the functions and roles of the outdated peers. Upon this background, BTA decided to redevelop the old piers into a waterfront in 2006 by case. Uh, the development project has been proceeded by case. As you see the slide, there are phase one and two and one pier maritime cluster. The blue colored area shows the container terminals and their functions will be maintained considering uh, the container volume uh, increasing. In case of phase one, it has been developed since 2008 and the survey infrastructure will be completed in 2022. BPA and the central government have injected 2.2 billion US dollar on this project. In phase one, waterfront park, maritime cluster zone, commercial zone, IT and media zone, and passenger terminals will be accommodated. Phase two will be developed uh, from 2024 into business and R&D zone, commercial zone, and waterfront zone. In particular, the city government has made efforts to bring the 2030 World Expo into this area. As part of the redevelopment project, BPA has developed the existing one pier into maritime cluster with accommodating industrial zone, maritime R&D, 
hydrogen failed vessel RND center and others. This cluster will play as a platform to foster and strengthen the competitiveness of maritime industry in Busan. As you see, the main purpose of the redevelopment project is to return the port area to citizens. In order for that, various public facilities like passenger terminal, marina, waterfront park, and opera house will be built and shared with the citizens. I believe that this redevelopment project will make significant contributions for the old city rehabilitation or with increasing the accessibility for the citizens to the redevelopment for the area. And it will also help Busan City take the positions of the hub of marine laser activities. Particularly, this renovation project will bring huge economic ripple effect of 30 billion US dollars and create 140,000 new jobs. More important thing is that in the process of developing the project directions and conducting this renovation, various opinions and advice from the citizens have been reflected and there have been mutual communication and coordination on a regular basis with the citizens as well. Uh, the last slide that I would like to share is the Busan port advancement into the world. In order to expand the Busan port uh, logistics net network and uh, to diversify uh, its business profile, uh, BPA has advanced into solar countries uh, with expanding its investment in Rotterdam and the Netherlands Barcelona, in Spain, Indonesia, and others. And BPA is still looking for new investment opportunities as well. So I would like to see the BPA's presence in India in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ki Channa. You have nicely brought out the details of the redevelopment projects which is undergoing there and the necessity and importance of maritime clusters in meeting the competition and being competitive. One of the ways is to work together in unison to reduce the process time, optimize processes and bring efficiencies, which could be seen in maritime clusters. The next topic in our session is on maritime clusters. We have a speaker Mr. Jose Firma from Port of Aku, Brazil. He has over 25 years of experience in oil and gas industry. In his earlier career, he headed operations of uh, Schlumberger Holdings in Brazil and Latin America. In his present capacity, his contribution to the port complex is well known. Over to you, Mr. Jose Firma. Morning. Boa tarde, good afternoon, uh, namaskar to all of you. So it's a, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here. And, and uh, let me start by thanking everybody that put Porto do Açu in this such of an important event. For us, a young port born in the middle of nowhere in Brazil is quite an important opportunity to be presenting to you here. I've learned a lot today already. Uh, about India and about India ports. Uh, I've learned that we both have more than 7,000 kilometers of coast. Uh, and we also know that both countries dream about and have the potential about being great powers, great economical powerhouses in the future. I can only imagine what we can do together. So I'm going to try to give you, let's see if technology allows me to give you a quick overview of Porto do Açu. Please uh, let me know if you can see my screen so I can continue. Yeah, we are able to see, please continue. 
Thank you very much. So let's let's what I what my objective today is create a bit of a curiosity in your minds about the sport in Brazil. We are located right there, right in the middle of Latin America or South America. And we are in Brazil, in the case of Brazil, between three very well-known large ports, Vitoria, Rio, and Santos, which are the main ports of the southeast of Brazil. We have majorly a uh, difference between us and them is these are large ports inside large cities. And obviously, they do have, for the future, for the next 50 years, they do have major challenges in terms of expansion. Their difficulties is our main advantage. We, as I'm going to show you, we have a port that was designed to really be the future port of Brazil. It was also located right in front of the main oil and gas activities in Brazil. You might know, but Brazil has encountered right in front of us there, the largest oil and gas reserves over the last 10 years. So definitely the port has a natural tendency to be able to be the major port for these operations, but it has a lot more. And I think this whole summit about port industrialization fits perfectly well what we want to do there. And it's our biggest um, at, challenge in the future. We we explain the port and hubs because it's easier. It was born with a green ring hub. I will tell you, show you a slide about it. Out of the entire port area, at least close to a third of it is dedicated to a reserve that is taken care by the port and it brings tremendous validation as well as alignment with the industrial development so that every industry that comes in has a platform and an opportunity to ensure that it's reduced the impact to the environment. The iron ore, the oil hub, and the gas and power are the most advanced ones. The logistic hub is ongoing. And then the industrial hub is what we're building right now so that we can truly impact the Brazil economy. I think that Porto do Sul has probably the best platform today to be able to be the major hub of industrial development in Brazil in the upcoming future. So here is the port. As you can see, two terminals. In 2014, it started with the two terminals operating. You can see on the right, the green, the reserve. So you give a little bit of an idea in terms of occupation of the port. So it's, it's a very large port and it's got 130 square kilometers of area. 40 of those are dedicated to Caruara. So it started with an iron ore export and, and a bit of a cluster of oil and gas, and it evolved with an oil terminal port and then the starting of our multi-cargo terminal that has the, the obviously the objective of being a cargo terminal, but also the objective to enable the industrial uh, development in there being the best way in which you can bring the entire industry. And we've done that with the, for instance, the GNA, this power plant that was developed uh, over the last uh, three years. It, took three years to develop a plant that in general takes five years to develop in Brazil because of the easy access to infrastructure, because of the capacity of importing everything through the terminal and then being only a few kilometers away from the industrial development. So it's a, it's a real good opportunity. Here's where we are today. I'm not gonna go into every detail. The idea is to create a bit of curiosity in your minds so we can explain better and then what we have we actually need to correct the slide yesterday the brazilian government launched its annual report for 2020 and we are now the second largest brazilian port in terms of cargo volume so third until last year and then last year second which is for us uh, very good so we were able to maintain the port operations and grow the port operations through this very very difficult year in 2020 uh, we have about 10 private terminals in there, and you can see today about 7,000 people.
but it's just the beginning. It's really just the beginning of what Porto do Azul is trying to do. So we, we've, we've been put a, a tremendous amount of investment in there. And we are at the point now in which we have three main areas that we're looking at. Expanding our core is making sure that we can continue to use the best of the infrastructure the way it is, but we need to do much more to be able to take those 90 square kilometers of area and industrialize it. So attract the industries, attract the countries that want to expand and create ties with us, create industries that bring synergy between countries in this case, it would be great to see what we can do together with India. And there's something that every port is trying to do, and we have a great opportunity, which is to be born low carbon. All the, all the big ports globally, I think, are looking at how are they going to uh, be able to attract and to be able to redesign themselves for this future economy, the society requirement of a low carbon industry. We really have the opportunity to build it from start in this manner, in this way. So show you really quick. Our partnership with you guys have been long. Uh, we're, we're a young port, but we always saw that by looking at India, we, we have to be able to maintain very close proximity and understand what you have, what you can do, and what we can do together. This is a great opportunity, and I'm sure it's a consequence of all these conversations that we had uh, with you throughout the years. And we had the opportunity to meet your ambassador uh, about a few months ago here in, in Brazil. So this is the challenge. As you can see, we're busy, but we have a big area on the back there that needs to be developed. So we expand the core. It's continued to develop the oil and gas capability, but then we need to go ahead. And I will present to you two uh, major projects that we're looking at today, which is the green, green steel hub and the fertilizing plant, as well as touch really quickly on what we are doing. And, and we probably have some really good news in the next weeks to announce in terms of what we're doing for this green economy, for this future industry of the planet that is starting to get really interested in ASU with the possibility of us inserting ourselves into dreams like hydrogen, green hydrogen and green ammonia. So the urea plant is something that Brazil is importing today, 85% of its hydrogen based fertilizing, and it is an agricultural country. So the only reason this is happening is because our natural gas for many, many years was not competitive. And we had a major spread between industrial and global prices of gas and Brazilian prices of gas. But there's a big revolution coming. Brazil is going to double its gas uh, capacity production over the next 10 years already because of what is done in terms of the opening of the oil and gas industry. And this is going to provide competitive natural gas soon. It's going to arrive into the continent really soon in the, in the very few years. So we have to be able to then be, ASU is the best platform, is the only place in Brazil that the gas is going to arrive and find straight industrial. All the, all the other places the gas will have to travel. In ASU, it stays there and it's consumed in there. And for us, fertilizing is the biggest opportunity of investment. And we also already have iron ore. So when we have iron ore and gas, we have a great opportunity to align ourselves and, and on, on top of exporting iron ore, export pellets, export HBI, be able to be a major hub for providing this transformation that is happening in the steel industry in order to produce steel with much lower carbon emissions. So we, we really believe these are the two major opportunities that are happening and there simply have no analog in Brazil in terms of having fertile environment for developing it uh, in Brazil. The Green Hub, I'm not gonna go very deep on it, but it's really amazing to see what we can do because we are just developing now, because we have major advantages in terms of being able to have all the, puzzle, all the pieces of the puzzle 
to develop this new economy, to develop the ability to go in a zoo and do something that will be a dream in most places around the globe. We can do parallel trends. We can develop only renewables or we can develop gas. We can develop the famous rain, rainbow structure in which we can invest on hydrogen, dream about the green hydrogen in the future, but build a economically viable project with gas until the transition. We all know that gas is going to be a major transition fuel for the economy in the future. And ASU has this great logistics and the, and the alignment in terms of what we can do in ASU in terms of dreaming about this industry of the future. It's really unlimited. It's not limited by land because we have it. It's not limited by access to international markets because the port is booming right now and, and still has a lot to evolve. It's not limited by water because we have great access to water, including reusable water in which we can even be more, um, our footprint can be even, even better for the environment. So it's really a great opportunity over there, closed and connected to this Karuara Reserve, which is really the, the crown jewel of, of what, we, what we do in ASU. It's really a, a special port that was born at the beginning, already connected to this idea of sustainability, already connected to the idea that every piece of investment in the industry can and should be used as well to be able to compensate for the environment. So it's a real exciting port. I would like to invite you to go to this uh, website or to go to YouTube and do a bit of a flyover. We created this ASU experience that you all can visit it as soon. And obviously, as soon as we all are able to travel, I invite everybody to come to us uh, in person and see the transformation we're making in Brazil. Thank you very much. And that's what I had. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jose Fuma. So we are developing port like ASU can leverage the strength to develop industries and hubs. You very nicely brought out. Thanks once again. We see on one hand, the government are bringing in new policies, easier framework and promote ease of doing business, ease of investing. Still, there are major challenges in developing the port cities and clusters industries around ports. It would be interesting to understand how your developer sees all this mirage of policies and facilitation measures. Today we have our next speaker, Mr. Sanjay Sharma, CEO Asler Metal India. He is a person of strong metal and high caliber. Way back in year 2001, he played a pivotal role in building Asler China's operation ground up. I request Mr. Sanjay Sharma to take the platform and walk us through his perspective on the portlet industrialization from the developer's point of view. Over to you, sir. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ravindran. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished panelists and uh, delegates. I would like to share the perspective of uh, manufacturing industry, particularly the large industry like steel industry, which lifeline ports are the lifeline for it and uh, essential to achieve global competitiveness. We are, if we look at broadly, the ports have evolved from uh, one level to another one. And the first generations were very simple cargo handling ports. Second generation came, which also started providing many services around it, many administrative and commercial services like uh, banking, freight forwarding, customs. And now is the third generation ports, which are creating the platform for uh, industrialization and creating a global supply chain. If we look at uh, the needs, uh, whether we look at the vessel size or for industry to scale up, or if we look at industry to 
develop specialization or if we look at uh, industry to develop the expertise at multiple locations, we can see how ports have played a very critical role, whether we look in uh, Europe or we look in places like Singapore or we just now heard about Busan or we look at Middle East in Zebel Ali or we look in China, whether Yangtze Delta or Pearl River Delta. Ports are the foundation stone of what uh, really has been uh, uh, possible with ports being the underlying factor. Indeed, uh, uh, I see uh, wonderful thoughts coming from Ministry of Shipping. Uh, Mr. Bhushan Kumar shared the uh, many things which are being unlocked and indeed the vision laid out by the government for 2030 is indeed very inspirational and and I see future as very bright. If we look at uh, ports, uh, indeed uh, logistics is one piece of it, but this logistics is bringing many other things. Industry be able to reach out to vast market, having the option to source globally in a very competitive way, developed a very focused manufacturing and one can, uh, large organization like ourselves, we develop the uh, expertise in certain place and then we scale it up and through that we can reach out to the world. And uh, and in the world of uh, tremendous competition and, uh, and sustainability, it becomes even more important to have scale. And ports are the only way when one can have scale and can reach out uh, globally. With many of the things performed closer to the customer, the only way is from one place to another, how do we reach out to customers? Like we as one of the largest supplier to automotive industry, we just follow our customers and the, and the customer is looking same solution irrespective of the country. And only way possible is be closer to ports. We look at uh, whether we look in uh, uh, Far East or if we look at in um, Eastern China or we look in Singapore, everywhere ports have been the bedrock of industrialization. And particularly when we look at how ports have uh, created the manufacturing uh, excellence, if we look at uh, even a places like Singapore, which started as a port and today have gone into more into services sector. Within the services also maritime services contribute close to 10% or so. So even when the economy transforms, ports also transform and play a role uh, beyond manufacturing in much bigger way. We heard from uh, Mr. Kichan Nam about uh, Busan, indeed, uh, if you look at Korea has done exceptionally well in terms of uh, ports and we can see how ports have transformed the country in last uh, uh, six decades. When we look at uh, China, be able to be almost 28% of global manufacturing. This integration has come through primarily through ports and, uh, and huge transformation impact from uh, uh, per capita income of below $1,000 20 years ago to now over $10,000. And uh, it's also, we can see that how seven out of 10 ports uh, are uh, in China. And now Vietnam replicating some of this model as it's looking to take up more space in manufacturing. In our country, we can see significant uh, improvement in terms of uh, logistics. Uh, in last uh, five years, we have uh, jumped by almost uh, uh, 10 uh, ranks. And uh, the coming decade, we will be more on the right hand side of the curve. And uh, reducing logistics cost is going to be a huge thing for industry to make industry globally competitive. We uh, brought to India best of the world. Uh, we as ArcelorMittal as uh, a 
most uh, global player and the largest steel player and uh, and nippon steel is uh, largest in uh, in japan indeed a global leading player and uh, combined together we have formed a jv to be in uh, india uh, i was here before the session was speaking very briefly with vincent that how in belgium ghent plant of ours is uh, is purely port based and uh, and it's one of the best plants in uh, in europe and uh, listening to uh, uh, jose fermas uh, session uh, when he talked about the port of asu indeed uh, i can relate to it just 300 kilometers up north uh, we have a large facility at uh, vitoria and uh, and uh, again it's purely port based and uh, industry is industry's lifeline is uh, ports in uh, india we invested uh, uh, december 2019 50000 crore roughly say 7 billion dollar um, in terms of uh, establishing an industrial footprint uh, through acquisition of our leading uh, steel company and our raw material is on the east coast where we work very closely with uh, Paradip Port, Vizek Port, and uh, and uh, through East Coast raw material is coming to the West Coast to Hazira. This is the largest uh, coastal plant uh, in uh, India, steel plant. All operations of ours are uh, primarily port port based, providing the flexibility for raw material, logistics cost, and finally bringing the product uh, in India as well as uh, for exports. And uh, these are my concluding uh, remarks that uh, port are essential for economic growth. And as the as we move more towards industrialization and manufacturing, then the role of ports become even more critical. And uh, we as a country are blessed with a huge uh, coastline, and it's a time uh, to turn this blessing into building a global compet competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sanjay Sharma. You have very quickly brought out how to successfully harness the power of ports to propel industrialization and growth. Thank you very much. I have pleasure in inviting now Mr. Vincent from our Port, Port of Zebra, Belgium. He is a honorary vice president of uh, Port of Zeebrugge. He is a leader who has been really active in multiple domains of the maritime industry, such as warehousing, distribution, ship repair, ship touring, employee union, and so on. I request you, sir, to kindly take the platform and discuss about the global best practices in ever-changing and rapidly evolving maritime sector. Over to you, Mr. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished guests. Dear friends, nice to see you all. Um, uh, I will try to limit my time uh, and respect the time given. It's a great opportunity to be there. Um, I liked very much uh, the presentation from Mr. Sharma, amongst the others, of course, and his slide where he showed that ports are evolving from cargo handling over logistic hubs into supply chain. And it's very much around that subject that I would like to uh, entertain you shortly here today. Um, and for that, I try to bring up a PowerPoint. Um, Okay, <clears throat> so dear friends, honorable guests and, and host, we are exiting a most challenging time and unique times, and we will find hopefully as we exit, uh, we will find changed business patterns and also change cons consumption patterns. Um, we will also see 
and we will discover that budgets have been blown out of proportion. And uh, as a result, the industry and the commercial world will seek for smart and cost-saving solutions. In all that, we believe and we are convinced that the maritime highways will dominantly serve the global trade. And if we turn to what the carrier strategy was in all that, you will see slides that in the container sector are very well known to you. Um, it was in unprecedented already before the uh, Corona uh, crisis. It was uh, unprecedented times where ship owners on their own could not bring in the necessary tools nor investment to serve the global trade with frequency, uh, with the massive number of containers that are needed to, 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 to serve the global trade. And they united. We've all seen that concentration over the last 15, 10 years, an immense exercise on the carrier side where companies that were fiercely competing with each other came into uh, alliances. Um, nowadays, in that sector, what we face is the availability of containers and the shortage uh, as a result, uh, the repositioning costs, which are immense. And we all know that in previous times, there was an idea to, to, to launch the white container, the uh, unlabeled container that could be available to all. Maybe in these times, it would be good that on the carrier side, this subject is brought up again as it would tremendously help in the availability of the containers and safe costs. But we are here to talk ports and ports per definition are linked to a location. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, linked to a location indeed. So, uh, but the result of the throughput in a port is always the customer, the buyer and the seller. They bring uh, together an import in the port or an export in the port. And uh, it is the responsibility of the ports in general to facilitate trade. We have all done major efforts and we covered it here today also. We have done major efforts in building out terminals to look at the nautical accessibility to, to be able to serve the giant uh, vessels that come into stream to make sure that the depths are there. And of course, this is still a very big part uh, that has to be realized, but there is more than that. We would like to put in the element of saying that ports beyond running a port have to be what we call facilitator of global trade. A facilitator of global trade, that means that high on the agenda of the port association, the global port association and other relevant institution, we should put the global trade on high on the agenda. Uh, ports have to bridge trade with regulations. We see too many instances where due to hurdles or different regulations, trade is hampered. And remember the first slide I showed you, or one of the first, the throughput in the ports is the result of these multi deals that are made between buyers and sellers. So we should be there to bridge these three trade deals with the regulations. To do that, our operations have to be transparent and linked to each other. 
and digitalization it's in every speech it's ever done but we we must realize and we do realize that the effort to do that with specialists the cost involved is massive uh, and so it needs to be one of the prime strategies also we have to know from the next ports and the previous score ports the capacities the sectors their strategy their progress uh, i discover in in two uh, uh, too many times as ports are linked to location they they devote much time on the efficiency of the tool which is absolutely justified but we don't know much about the previous ports or the next port and with that knowledge starts the network and assisting our customers and our trade and as all is dealt with persons this data should be linked to to know who's who in this chain of ports so that when challenges uh, or hurdles occur we know who to address We've gone a step farther, further in as far as the ports of Zeebrugge and Antwerp is concerned. Both ports are 80 kilometers from each other. I saw from the presentation of Busan that there is a complex where they run uh, three different port sites over 25 kilometers. So where we, uh, Zeebrugge and Belgium, Zeebrugge and Antwerp rather, we competed over 130, 140 years. We have decided and we announced 14 days ago that we are going to merge because we discovered that there is a, a big complementarity in the sectors of activity. Uh, Antwerp is an inland port, Zeebrugge is a seaport. If we combine these strengths, we can offer the full service package to the customers and we are leaders in various sectors together, like chemicals, containers, the automotive, intra-European trade. And so the merger will provide, uh, not limiting the necessary funds for what I mentioned earlier, earlier the digitalization, to digitalize, to uh, make transport, transparent the whole uh, service uh, patterns of the two ports into one complex. It will give the critical mass to further improve the hinterland locations uh, to, to improve in terms of uh, utilization, but also in terms of more services to the hinterland. It will further, as we bring together our strengths, it will further enhance our leading position and it will lead our way into the energy transition, which is fully underway. So to conclude, we would say ports separately, first of all, they must devote all their energy and their investments to make their port infrastructure efficient and in line with the demand of the customers, but separately, and that is a subject of today, ports have to understand and implement that they are part of the global supply chain. They have that duty versus their importers and exporters that use the port. They have to do it through running a transparent operation be a source of market intelligence and activate its service levels to erase inefficiencies and further boost trades potentials. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Vincent, for sharing your thoughts on the global best practices, the port strategy to be facilitator of the global trade, cooperation among the ports and you discussed about the future of uh, 
and verb and group. Thank you very much. Now we have the last session, last speaker for this session. I now request Mr. Jet Jen Yuvan Jose, the Managing Director, Port of Amsterdam International. He is advisor to the Board of Port of Amsterdam on international developments, business development and projects. He also holds the position of Managing Director of Amsterdam Port Consultants, a collaboration between multiple ports and cruise related companies and knowledge institutes. Over to you, sir. Kindly unmute, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, am I able to, uh, to share or will you uh, steer it? Very good, thank you. Um, Honorable Minister of State, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished uh, guests of this, uh, this conference, um, uh, Namaste. It's a pleasure to participate on um, on this uh, this conference uh, on port cities, uh, building port cities and maritime clusters. Um, in previous conferences, we we touched uh, the development of ports, uh, also in India, from the service port to the tool ports uh, to the, the the landlord ports and the industrial ports and network ports. Um, and I uh, we we had uh, we had a discussions uh, previously on the. Uh, uh, the port rankings based on throughput, uh, and which is moving more and more towards uh, creating added value. And we created also um, um, like a discussion on um, the, uh, the tension between port development and urban development. Uh, for instance, the cruise projects in urban areas where we have been working together with uh, our partners from, uh, from JMB. Um, Today, I would like to emphasize on the changing scope of a modern metropolitan port uh, like Amsterdam, uh, serving not only its hinterland for shipping, uh, but also uh, serving its metropolitan area. Um, and then there is an interesting link with the, uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint, the presentation from uh, the CEO of ASU, uh, Mr. Jose Firmo. Uh, for the, the green port development, um, as a green uh, as a green uh, project, the green port project, uh, that's from a different angle than from uh, a port which need to trans uh, to transfer into a different uh, green port uh, development. Um, yes, please. Next slide. Well, Port of Amsterdam is, uh, say, from the angle of number, port number four in uh, in northwestern uh, Europe, with uh, one of the the, the main uh, steel mills in the Netherlands. Uh, Tata Steel is located in our port area. Yes, please. And when you look at the port in, of Amsterdam in numbers, I already mentioned port number four in uh, in Europe. Uh, with a throughput of, uh, of over 105 million tons, um, mainly an energy hub. And that's what I would like to emphasize on energy and energy transition in my, uh, uh, in my speech. Um, mainly an energy hub, um, like the biggest gasoline uh, port uh, in the world, uh, but also like uh, big in uh, agricultural uh, products like uh, cocoa. Uh, the biggest importing uh, uh, an industrial uh, hub for for cocoa uh, in uh, in uh, in the world. Um, also, um, a substantial uh, cruise port, uh, like a top ten port in, uh, in in Europe. Just to give a bit of the the picture of Amsterdam. Yes, please. Um, Looking at, uh, at the European Union and the relation between the Netherlands and the Port of Amsterdam and the European Union, 
Um, well, it's clear that seaports have an important role to play uh, in achieving the uh, European Union goals set in the European Green Deal. And that is uh, for a big part a shift, a model shift from trucking towards uh, short sea, rail and barge, which contributes towards a decrease in the carbon emissions. Yes, please. And you can find this in the, uh, the trans European transport networks, uh, like which is mentioned on the, uh, on the, on the map of, uh, of Europe with the, uh, the economic uh, banana. Um, and the, uh, the trans European transport network policy addresses uh, the implementation and development of a European uh, wide network of railway lines, roads, inland waterways, uh, uh, maritime shipping routes, ports, airports, and railroad terminals. Well, the most important corridors for the Port of Amsterdam are then the North Sea Baltic, the Rhine Alpine, and the North Sea Mediterranean corridors. And uh, these are these link Amsterdam with the uh, main uh, European logistic nodes. Yes, please. Um, the vision of the Port of Amsterdam um, is uh, to come closer and closer to the vision of the Amsterdam Metropolitan Port, and that's strengthening, connecting, and achieving. We believe that a seaport should not only be seen as a separate entity. Uh, the port should be like an integral part of a metropolitan area, a place where industry, logistics and energy come together and contribute towards the, the development of the whole region. And our aim is to develop uh, the region, the port region, in such a way that it will create uh, value for people and their environment. And this will entail developing the port region uh, as an innovative hub for the circular and bio-based economy to achieve jobs, uh, new products, and add value in the partnerships with the market and our surrounding community. Yes, please. The Port of Amsterdam is such as a vital part for the metropolitan area, uh, for the city, which is probably known to you with like a beautiful historical center with the canals. Um, but also all the people which live in that whole area, uh, the businesses in the port uh, provide the city with uh, things like uh, garbage disposal services, but also create the energy sources, uh, have the logistics arranged uh, as from the, uh, the heart of the, the port hub uh, and creating jobs. And the synergy between uh, the port and the city continues to grow with an increasing need for, for cargo and energy in the metropolitan area. Yes, please. And then <clears throat> this leads to uh, the, uh, our strategy uh, towards the transition. Um, as an example, um, in, uh, in 2017, we already stated as, as the very first one in the world that we will not uh, handle anymore, we do not facilitate uh, coal import exports as from 2030, uh, which was by then a very difficult step uh, to take. Uh, but we believe that we are moving more and more towards more sustainable society with non fossil energies. Um, and uh, by 2025, uh, the Port of Amsterdam will be a leading European seaport in the transition. Uh, towards a sustainable society. That's our main goal. Um, uh, so the, the focus is on the transition from fossil to post-fossil energy. As mentioned, we are a major uh, gasoline hub uh, in, uh, and we are a number two port in, uh, in Europe for the uh, import and export of coal. Um, the, so the traditional focus on cargo volumes switches towards uh, activities and we uh, allocate uh, space for these new activities um, we create added value for the port uh, for the city and for the region with a lot more attention uh, attention for the uh, for the demands for the circular economy and the integration between the various companies and um, we all are convinced that like a transition of energy sources will be a long process. Absolutely. 
Um, current carbon-based activities, they are instrumental uh, in preparing for uh, all the future developments. And um, we see this, this strategic long-term planning as, uh, as, as, as vital uh, for, uh, for our port. Yes, please. And that will be that towards 2025, we developed this in three steps, in three pillars. One is the investments in infrastructure for sustainable energy, for hydrogen and for, uh, for offshore. And just to give you an idea, we are investing uh, the coming years more in uh, investment under the ground than uh, in investments in key walls, which are visible, uh, and in, in pavements. Uh, so that's, it's a change of scope also for our infrastructure departments. Um, uh, so apart from the investment in infrastructure for sustainable energy, um, we also invest in the, the nautical operations. Um, so to have a more predictable and more safe and smooth uh, nautical uh, product. And uh, at the moment, 90% of all the vessels are handled according to the schedule. And in four years time, this will be uh, 95%. And that's how we try to, uh, uh, to optimize our total process, including the nautical process. But we also facilitate, and that is the, uh, the, the top one, in uh, sustainable growth. We help existing companies to become more sustainable and uh, to, to electrify them more and more. Uh, we change existing cargo streams from oil terms, which can be used in the future for biofuels or for, for other oils, bio oils. Um, we attract new companies that contribute to the circular economy. Um, uh, for instance, uh, for the recycling of all kinds of plastics. Um, uh, but also for we attract hydro, hydrogen uh, production facilities. Yes, please. Um, this is the infrastructure uh, from uh, from different angles, uh, but I will get more in detail in the in the coming in the upcoming slides, please. And here you see uh, like a map of the uh, the port of Amsterdam, uh, with on your uh, on, on one side the the, the city center, uh, and on the other side the North Sea. And when you start at the North Sea side, uh, we'll see uh, the offshore uh, wind farms at, uh, at the North Sea, um, which produce green energy. Um, that is brought onshore uh, and uh, is brought to the electrolyzer at Tata Steel, which converts the electricity to hydrogen. Um, that is transported, uh, that hydrogen, uh, towards the port of Amsterdam. The port stores the hydrogen and becomes, in this sense, a hydrogen hub. Um, and that hydrogen hub is a part of the national uh, hydrogen backbone. The hydrogen backbone that distributes hydrogen to be used, for instance, for Schiphol Airport, for the aviation industry, but also for the mobility for, for, for cars and trucks and for the industry. Yes, please. And this is how we uh, what I what I just described. So from uh, the offshore wind up to the the residential heating and the mobility the, and uh, yeah the, that total scope including uh, including the airport. Yes, please. And when I talk about airports, we. Uh, we have uh, developed uh, the uh, the synthetic um, uh, kerosene, um, like uh, the startup company that's a collaboration between various companies uh, like the Port of Amsterdam, Royal Schiphol Group, uh, KLM. Um, but they uh, are um, working on creating synthetic uh, kerosene and to uh, develop this for the aviation uh, industry to um, to make also the aviation industry more green. Yes, please. The bio-based and, uh, and and circular uh, industry is 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 very strong in the uh, in the port of Amsterdam. 
uh, it often develops from startup companies which are expanding more and more and which fly out also uh, to serve international markets. Um, creating the ecosystem, that's, that's a key thing from according to our view. And uh, we'll see that there's a lot of collaboration, there's a lot of co-siting, as we call it, that companies strengthen uh, one another. And clustering uh, these uh, companies from bio-based and circular uh, companies uh, creates like a lot of competitive advantages, reduces costs and, and traffic, and uh, well emphasizes uh, Amsterdam as front runner on the uh, transition of energy uh, uh, in the port, as well as uh, uh, the uh, the circular economy, uh, which is uh, strongly promoted by uh, by us. Yes, please. Um, what well, as mentioned, we uh, have been uh, the we, we have been acting as a as a port. We in uh, uh, we invest uh, in in in, uh, in the port. We facilitate uh, our uh, our companies, uh, but also we promote uh, companies uh, in uh, in our port, and, and we also promote the uh, uh, our aid, our aim uh, to create like a hydrogen hub. In, in Amsterdam by intensify, by sponsoring the, the Dutch Olympic team um, and the, the, the Olympic Games will be uh, the Olympic hydrogen games emission free uh, so that that very much is in line with, uh, with how we look at, uh, at at the future and um, so we do a lot uh, together with uh, with various big and smaller companies um, we work together with our partners from Amsterdam Port Consultants in uh, in the Netherlands, but also with uh, with international partners like uh, what you mentioned here with our uh, our friends from uh, from JM Baxi, and um, we would like to make uh, the difference uh, and, uh, together with uh, with you, with all Indian partners and, uh, and international partners uh, uh, attending. Um, we'd like to invite you uh, also uh, to. Uh, to, to see how what we can mean for uh, for each other, how we can contribute to a better world, but also how we can contribute to a world which has ports which are not solely uh, responsible for the shipping and for the supply chain, but they also act more in creating uh, the uh, step forward in the energy transition and in the circular economy. So I hope that we can uh, can join forces. And uh, it will be great to, uh, to work together with uh, with you all. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. 55% uh, decrease in uh, emissions by 2030 and three quarters of road transport has to be moved by rail and waterways. Really a tall target. We have uh, come to the end of this session. Uh, on Portland <coughs> industrialization. I'm certain that our speakers not only gave us an immense input on the topic, but also triggered inquisitiveness amongst us about the evaluation, evolution of the ports and their vital role. The question and answer session, we may not be able to have for uh, the time what we planned because already we have uh, bust the time. However, maybe five minutes only we will take I will collect the questions. I have taken two questions only. I would request the uh, speakers to be very brief. Within two minutes, they can answer. The first question, a lot of questions are there. Let us have only these two. One, the first is to Mr. Ki Chan Nam, Busan Port Authority. Sir, uh, you have discussed about the redevelopment plan. And you have also told there are three agencies together in this redevelopment involved. One is the central government, then the city government, and the Busan Port Authority. What are the main roles for these authorities? And what do you do? Are there no conflicts? If there are, what do you do to resolve them? Yes. Uh, the central government is mainly in charge of establishing the master plan and the final approval on the business implementation. 
Uh, the local government has the right of uh, the approval on tenant buildings uh, in the redeveloped area. BPA is the leading player to realize the project and responsible uh, from, uh, so for survey infrastructure establishment, uh, property management to design and building. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Another question, this is to Mr. Sanjay Sharma. From a developer's perspective, who operates in India as well as many countries in the globe, can you share with us some of the insights of this ease of doing business and facilitations offered by the government to help the trade and the investors? Suggestions for uh, India to propel Indian ports further up the ranking. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think uh, a biggest change uh, coming in our country is ports being used now for bigger industrial cluster and uh, not simply a logistics hub, but integrated services, whether uh, these are of transport or commerce or providing the infrastructure to build, build large scale industries. What we are seeing uh, also in a big way, the leaderships at the port level and the government level is very contemporary and uh, forward looking. It's more about how do we build these third generation ports? How do we digitalize? How do we provide services to attract industry? And uh, I personally believe that with this thought in place, we should be able to unlock in a big way our blessings of huge coastline and uh, and develop the ports which makes the industry globally competitive thank, thank you mr sharma i am grateful and sincerely thank all the maritime leaders and the speakers of this session who joined us virtually from five partner countries across the world while this session may be over due to paucity of time the learnings shall continue by following your active contributions in your respective field, which will keep us motivated and guided at all times. I thank all the conveners for making this session a possibility. I also thank the professionals, delegates, educators, and students who all have joined this session virtually. Thank you all once again. This is Ravindran, Chairman Chennai Port, signing off on behalf of Maritime 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Chin, sab badhiya ho gaya. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much. <laughs>